As promised, it's time to have a look at the primaries panel that was introduced to the Sigmoid module in Darktable 4.6. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 137 of Understanding Darktable. I reached out to Flannelhead via the pixels.us forum, and we traded a couple of messages backward and forward because I wanted to try and make sure I understood what he was going for with this particular panel within the Sigmoid module. And essentially what it comes down to is this. If you've got images with really intense swatches of color, now obviously the key you know, offender here is anything with LED lighting, particularly blue LED lighting. But it could also be images with someone in a fluoro safety vest. You know, things like that where you've got really bright, really intense colors. That's where the primaries panel in Sigmoid is going to come to your advantage. So I've found three images from my library where there is, well, two of them have LED lighting. One of them is a sunset. So let's dive on in and see what we get when we introduce the primaries panel in Sigmoid. So what I've got here is a nighttime long exposure of the city skyline of Perth in Western Australia. And as we can see, there is this blue light on the top of this building over here on the right that is reflecting off the water. And if we zoom in, we can see that there is just this massive swathe of pixels which are just at the maximum brightness and the most saturated blue and there's just no gradation there's no detail whatsoever in that section of the image and I'll have to confess you know when Darktable 4.6 was released at Christmas time and we got the RGB primaries module and the new version of Sigmoid with the primaries panel up until that point I'd never really noticed how this sort of artifact displayed, not only in my photos, but in so many other people's photos on the web. And it's a revelation to me. So I've deliberately turned off uh, Filmic RGB. You can see that in the history stack there where I've turned that off because I wanted you to see what the image looks like before we apply any tone mapping. Because remember our two main tone mapping modules in Darktable are Filmic RGB and Sigmoid. So we go over to the tone group, we expand the Sigmoid module, and I've expanded the primaries panel here. And before we go trying to correct this image, let's just have a look at the controls that are here in the primaries panel. First up, the base primaries. This dropdown has a handful of different profiles that you can choose from and the only time you would bother using any of these last four like if the only reason you would move off work profile is if you were creating a preset and the reason you might do that is because work profile simply means whatever I am using as the working profile in the input color profile module, which appears here in our pixel pipe. So we can see working profile is linear rec 2020 RGB. If you were going to change the working profile in the input color profile module, then you might want to save any sigmoid presets that you were going to save with the actual color space that you want sigmoid to use when it does its thing because if you leave it on work profile then it will use whatever working profile you choose in the input color profile module so for all intents and purposes if you're just using this on a per image basis leave the base primaries on working profile because that will use whatever you've defined in the input color profile module. Below that, we have six sliders. Red attenuation, red rotation, green attenuation, green rotation, blue attenuation, blue rotation. And then a seventh slider, recover purity. Now, 
The word attenuation means to turn something down. And this is where I have my first and possibly only gripe with the user interface for this primaries panel. Flannelhead, if you're watching, was there a reason that you didn't set the default value or, or position for this little white control slider, I didn't want that to turn on, on the left hand side? Because it seems to me it should really start on the right hand side. So if I'm attenuating or turning the red value down, I should be dragging that slider to the left. It's completely unintuitive, at least to me, that if I want to turn the intensity of any of those three channels down, that I should be dragging the slider from left to right. That just makes no sense to me whatsoever. Now, maybe there is a scientific or a mathematical reason for why you did it that way. And if there is, please enlighten us. That is probably my only gripe. That just seems completely counterintuitive to my brain. If anyone else has any input on that, I'm, I'm keen to hear it. But the idea here is that the attenuation slider allows us to turn down the purity of that particular channel. So as we increase the attenuation, we are reducing the purity of whichever channel it is we're working on. So in this case, we're going to work on the blue channel. So as we drag that to the right, you can see that suddenly there's detail back in that area where before it was just this massive wash of solid blue pixels with no detail whatsoever. Now, obviously what happens as you do that is the color tends to wash out towards white. And obviously we want the vivid colors, right? But we don't want them to just be this solid mash of blue, like someone grabbed a blue paintbrush and went right across the image. We want there to be some detail. And that's where the recover purity slider comes in. When I was having my private conversation with Flannelhead, he said to me, you know, the, the, that recover purity slider is there so that if you've had to attenuate so far that you, you know, you feel like you've lost the intensity of the color, the recover purity slider will allow you to bring some of that color intensity back, but not wash out all of the detail and take you back to a, you know, where you started with this big solid blue splotch. And it's a bit of a juggling act. You know, you've got to work out what is it you are prepared to tolerate in terms of getting close to that point where the colors just blow out into a, a wash of just all blue pixels and how much color intensity you want. Now, what we haven't addressed yet is the rotation sliders. At the moment, I'm on my normal histogram view. I'm just gonna jump over to the vector scope view. And what we will see with the blue rotation is here's all of our blue channel information here. If we drag the rotation slider to the left, we will shift our blues towards cyan. And if we drag the slider to the right, we will move our blues towards magenta. So let's give that a try. And you can see it both in the image and on the vector scope that the color information for the blue channel is being swung either towards cyan or towards magenta. And the same sort of thing would apply for the green channel and the red channel, where with the red channel, you would be swinging between, you know, oranges and yellows on one side and magentas and purples on the other side. With the green channel, you're basically swinging between yellow and cyan. All right, let's look at another image, shall we? What we can see here is a sunset that is completely blown out. It looks horrendous. You can see from my history stack, I've been mucking around with a lot of different variations here. If we start with the smooth preset, straight away, that, that sunset just looks so much better. All of those really 
clipped gradations have disappeared and we've now actually got nice smooth tones there. Maybe not as intense as what we had, but it still looks a lot better. Let's check our gamut. We can see that there are some gamut issues right there around the sun, as you would expect, a little bit here in the shadows, that's to be expected as well. So let's try reducing the reds a bit further. And then if we increase our purity, we can see that that increases the reds both here and in the sand face. When I say here, I meant the, uh, the sunset. So the reds have increased here with the sunset. They've also increased over here on the sand bank uh, with that recover purity slider. If I bring it right down, we lose some of the reds, bring it up, they come back. But again, if we turn on our gamut warning, we can see that that has pushed more pixels out of gamut. All right, let's turn that gamut warning off and let's move our red rotation. So if we drag our red slider to the left, you would expect that to be towards yellow, but it's actually the other way around. It's left is towards magenta and right is towards yellow. So if we drag the red rotation to the left, we can see that our sunset has shifted towards magenta. And if we drag it towards the right, we get much more of that nice yellow of a setting sun. Now, the last thing that we have yet to cover are these two sections here, the color processing and the preserve hue. Color processing has per channel, which is the option you need to use if you want the primaries panel, because if you choose RGB ratio, you lose the primaries and you also lose the preserve hue slider. Now, in his original post on pixels.us, Flannelhead talks about how particularly with sunsets and skin tones, quite often they shift towards a bit of a salmon pink color. And he says that when you increase preserve hue, you will see that. And if I do that, we can see exactly that. This allows you to bring that back if you want to. But I've got to say for me, I'd much prefer that I had a nice golden sunset rather than a pink sunset. But it's subjective. They're your photos, it's your art, you choose what works for you. Okay, people, I am going to leave it there. I'm sure there is more nuance and detail to this than even I understand at this point in time. But I will say this, I've been going back and processing a lot of my images which have, you know, sunsets or LED lights. And between the RGB primaries module and the primaries panel in Sigmoid, I am getting much nicer results than what I've had in the past. So definitely would recommend that you spend some time with both of those modules and uh, get familiar with what it can do for your images, particularly with those strong LED lights. You will have noticed, I meant to mention this at the end of episode 136 and I completely forgot, that I now have a 4K monitor. I decided to splash out at Christmas time and buy myself a Christmas present. I was in this conundrum where, you know, I've got two monitors here, right? And I used to have the Dell monitor sitting here as my main monitor. And I had a BenQ monitor in the second position. And what was happening was the BenQ monitor, I think it was dying because it kept on changing its brightness level. I'd set it to a certain value. I'd shut my computer down. Next time I'd come back and turn it on, there'd be all this, it'd be a completely different setting. And so I thought, okay, I wouldn't mind getting a 4K monitor. I'd like to get something that's you know, good for color grading. I don't want to spend three, $4,000 on an ISO monitor. There must be something in the middle. And what I found was the ASUS ProArt PA279CRV. This is just gorgeous. I love this monitor and I cannot tell you how many images I have gone back and reprocessed because I now feel like the difference I used to see between the Dell monitor, which I thought was a great monitor, and the BenQ monitor, which I was not all that impressed with. It's like the same difference again. This is Kalman verified. It's got about 
seven different color profiles built into it. It's just gorgeous. And the fantastic thing is, is that you can change the color profile according to the type of work that you're doing. And the images that I've gone back and reprocessed, I'm just so happy. And even when I view the new rendered versions of these images on screens which are not calibrated, they still look a million percent better. So I've got to say, I am very happy with this monitor. I think it was money well spent. Anyway, just wanted to let you know that that's why you will now see that my videos are in true 4K resolution. Obviously, I've got the scaling at 2x because, you know, if you had everything at native 4K, everything would be microscopic and my eyes aren't that good. <laughs> so there we go. The one issue I have at the moment, though, is... I've got one monitor running at 4K and the Dell monitor, which is now in second position, running at 1920 by 1080 with scaling at 1X. And of course, not everything adjusts beautifully between the two monitors. Sometimes a window will pop up for an app and it'll look great on 2X scaling at 4K on this monitor but you drag it over to this monitor and it looks super tiny. Or if you get it at the right size on here, you drag it to the 4K monitor and it's like, blah, massive. But anyway, that's a problem for another day. It just means I need a second 4K monitor. <laughs> That'll come in time. All right, people, I think that will do for now. Um, questions, comments, sing out down below and I will catch you in the next one.